did you learn a lot from working with Teal or what, did, what, what have you learned from him? I've learned a lot from him, like an absurd amount. I think he, I mean, he has a million superpowers. I'd say like maybe the two best superpowers are like attracting incredible people that would maybe be number one. Number two is, and he's called it a look ahead function, which is a, a, f a funny way of putting it, but his ability to like evaluate a project and be into the future of like, is this going to work or is it not going to work based on like its current elements it is, is Nostradamus esque. <laughs> it's, it's freaky. Now is the time to take risk. Yo, what's up guys. Hope you guys are doing well. Today, we have a podcast with Jesse Michaels. He's an awesome dude. He actually is an investor at Teal Capital, which is Peter Teal's like family office. And at the same time, he's recently started making content under the brand American Alchemy. And so like he's creating this new brand. It's really cool. And he talks about like esoteric ideas like are aliens real? He talks about quantum physics uh, and a bunch of other just crazy out there ideas. And so I was like, okay, look, we got, we got to get him on the podcast just hang out. So this conversation was really fun. It's more conversational than most of my other podcasts, which have been like asking researchers like questions about their research. This one's more conversational. So I hope you guys enjoy. And without any further ado, let's get into it. Let's, uh, let's get it started, man. <laughs> let's do it. I love it. Okay. I'm cool. pumped. So honored to be here. Yeah. Yeah, man. Jesse, thank you for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate hell, it. <laughs> hell yeah. I can't wait. Look, I, I could like try to intro you myself, but there's so many different things and so many different ways that you can be described. So like, how do you describe yourself at this time? I'm so bad at describing myself. <laughs> and when people ask me what I do, I give them like the most lame, like <laughs> I invested in tech or whatever. And then it's funny, actually, I was, I was at a conference the other day and I said that to somebody and it was like this woman who clearly was like super intuitive. And she was like, I think you're like a very like. She said this with, I didn't say anything. She was like, I think you're actually deep, like way more philosophical than you are necessarily just interested in tech. And I was like, what? And she's like, <laughs> she's like, say more about that. Cause it's, it's not just tech investing. And I was like, you're that's spot on, but yeah, I'm, I'm, it's hard to sort of, I guess, c categorize, but uh, yeah, I guess the, the, the career kind of the short of it is I studied history at, at Columbia. I was really interested in kind of like public ideas and and, and public life and politics and society. And so I, I worked at, <laughs> I worked for uh, John Stewart at the daily show. I just, as an intern, and then I did the same for, for Charlie Rose and was all, I th always thought I was going to get into media and then worked at Google for, for four years. And I, I loved my experience there, but I, I also felt like there was a lot of kind of like bureaucracy and red tape. And I was kind of frustrated with, with that. And by the end of my time there, I thought that maybe kind of born of that frustration and of my interest in like ideas and, and, and interesting people, I could just bring people into Google's like Ted talks equivalent and interview them. And maybe that would be generative in terms of finding my next thing. I hit up Peter as part of that Peter Thiel, who's my current boss. He actually couldn't make it into the talk, but we ended up getting lunch and just hit it off. Yeah. And then from there, over the last four years, I've been, I've been at, at Thiel Capital and I've worn a few different hats. One is it is just cut and dry, kind of like tech investing, like have like a P and L that needs to perform. So it's <laughs> almost like a little, little fund within the, within the family office. And then mm -hmm. the other part of the role is like bringing in interesting thinkers and, and, and ideas. And that's sort of parlayed nicely into producing the portal, which as we were talking about, we sh I hope so, gets restarted at some point. And then you, and my you produce, show. you produce the portal. Yeah. Yeah. I did. What so do you was, mean by that? So you get the guests for that? Yeah, I would get all the guests for, for that and like help with the research and the, and the programming. It was pretty turnkey in terms of the, the actual production itself. I kind of set up a deal with a, with a studio out here and it helped with like the initial strategy in terms of like ad sales and stuff, but that also oh, you nice. know, kind of, kind of right. runs itself at, at, at a certain point. So really, <laughs> yeah, ma mainly like getting guests and, mm. and that, that's so funny. Cause that intro is not what I would have said at all. Well, first off, I didn't even know you worked at the Daily Show. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> I yeah. guess you're you're dating yourself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I am, man. I, you, am. I I totally thought you were like maybe you're older than I thought. <laughs> I, I, I I'm I'm thirty. Thirty. Oh man, yeah. man, I'm I'm kind of scared to turn thirty. <laughs> yeah, it, it is scary seeing that number. You're like, oh shit, beginning <laughs> but, again. 
but so so then you started your own content and so that's the thing that i i, I you know how i would have said it is yeah. that you're now like a content creator who's also a partner or also working at teal but like wh why did you start your own content yeah and we've had these conversations in private a lot so i want to i want to get your your take on this as well but like i i was looking at like in you know the investing i was doing and it was a lot of fun and partially i had this like amazing cheat code if you will or like undo access that i was lucky to get because i work with one of the best tech investors of all time and he has a great reputation and people want us on their cap table i and i and so, or you just go for it i was just gonna say i remember when i got an email from you in like 2019 yeah. or 2020 and i was like oh teal cap like <laughs> i was so pumped i like yeah. i have you but i was i was really pumped that i was like oh man i'm gonna connect with teal cap <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> no it's like that it's like the sun too like a uh, battle is won or lost before it's fought it's like an email is won or a loss before it's fought and like <laughs> i i'm lucky that i got popped into a role where i had a, a lot of leverage and i saw that and i was like okay like on a go forward basis i sort of want to do that in my own way in terms of building building a brand around really cool ideas and then the other thing i think is just like the macro of, of of venture right now and i know we've had a lot of these conversations but like look at if you look at like late stage venture right now look at like the multiples a lot of these companies are trading at and then you compare them to their kind of public equivalents that are trading at literally half the multiples mm -hmm. and then the amount of money that's been raised by these late stage funds like tiger and vision fund and all these sovereign wealth funds i look at that and and i'm like late stage venture just really whatever the arb was over the last four or five years which was like private late stage stuff was actually underpriced mm -hmm. has flipped and so I think really, if you were to try to position yourself, and this is serendipitous because it's what I would want to do anyways, it's like what I'd enjoy spending my time doing is like being really upstream, like playing really early, meeting people before they start companies or right as they're starting companies and being pretty differentiated in terms of deal flow. And I do think putting out content, specifically content that's weird and outside the Overton window and about frontier tech, which I know you're. On I mean, that's all I think content, content it, it, about. <laughs> exactly. You're amazing at it. And I think doing that is, is a really cool top of the funnel generator for, for deal flow. And so I reached out to you because I was like, this kid is like miles ahead of me <laughs> in terms of doing that, like actually executing on that thesis. And so I'm just yeah, trying I mean, to be an that... abstract. <laughs> <laughs> no, guys, I, I did not tell him to say that. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, the way that I think about it, were kind of what got me interested in it was uh, the Paul Graham essays, of course. But then later on, I was like, okay, if I'm a content creator and like the late stage is really difficult to make money in, yeah. you can kind of like create content. And then you have a funnel of interesting people that like go into engineering. They're like in first year engineering. And then after a few years of like, you've been making content, they get out of engineering. They want to start a startup, whatever. And they, you're the first person that they talk to because like, They've watched your content. They know you're interested in this kind of stuff. Like, totally. I, I think that's the deal flow instead of like going to a university, it, like you are going to universities just <clears throat> online and it's, it's distributed. Totally, man. And like, if you do the thought experiment of like, I don't know if he does invest, but like, if like Lex Friedman invested, like, would he get like good access to like great early stage stuff? Like for sure he would, or even like Rogan, if he, if he invested, like, you know, it just, I, for them, I don't think it's their, their core competence or they, you know, it kind of stick within their wheelhouse. And so I, I love what you're doing and you heard it here first. When NASDAQ <laughs> starts a fund, we're going to, we're going to back it. <laughs> you're going to back it. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, my beans will harvest. <laughs> I know we keep talking about that all the time. But speaking of like raising funds, do you want to raise a fund off of your own content? I, I think it'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm, I would definitely want to, whatever I do. I feel like, like, like in some ways I was given a life raft and saved by TC and, and Peter. And so I, I want, you know, him to back whatever, whatever I did next, mm -hmm. but I'd be, I'd be super interested. I think at, at some point in, in doing that, I think it's a, it is a question of like, can't, can you build the brand to the, to the level where like you, you are getting really good kind of asymmetric access to, to early stuff where, where it becomes its own sort of, sort of cheat code. 
And then I do think the activation energy of like starting a show is like, a, is, is a lot. And then it doesn't necessarily hit cruise control, but things get easier as you, as you figure things out a little more. And so right now I'm still in, in kind of growth mode on the, on the show, but theoretically in the future, I would uh, love to raise a fund. Will you NASDAQ raise a fund in the future at some point? Maybe at some point, like I'd mentioned a second ago, my beans should be like a mini venture fund. And then, and then that, I don't know, because the thing is like, like, I think I'm deciding what kind of person I am. Uh, like, do I want to have a lot of assets under management and have like a ton of LPs who are my bosses and then build that fund? Or do I want to kind of focus on kind of the content side and my own managing my own money? and like making money from content and then investing that into startups. And then also like I own a hundred percent of the gains. So I think that's kind of like, uh, my thought process has kind of been most GPs actually, they, they, you know, maybe they leave a startup job to raise a fund and they don't actually have income streams other than management fees. Right. Yeah. But if I'm a content creator and I mean, <laughs> you know, Right now, I would say like on YouTube, we're, we're not making shit, right? Like we don't make anything, yeah. uh, but maybe, you know, if the podcast does well and then, and then the beans too, and other, other investments do well, then like I have my own money and, and I'm less concerned about, um, I don't know. So I, I think like yeah. I can make my own money as a content creator and then use that to invest. And then also it. if I'm doing like, if I'm investing in smaller companies that are just raising, like first off I'm NASDAQ. So they want me on the cap table just, just for that. Like maybe yeah. eventually like down, downstream, like I can promote them, help them hire and stuff like that. Yep. And then also like, it, it's a smaller check required. It's not, you know, a series D company or something that requires multi-million dollars. So yeah. I don't know, I guess I'm deciding like, because most, and you know, now this is about me, but most of my content is frontier tech. And so it'll be very early stage. It's not really series D kind of investing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, man. My favorite investors start by investing their own capital and it shows that they're really high conviction. They're not just playing fast and loose with other people's money. And I, I mean, for what it's worth, I have no liquidity right now because I put all my own personal capital into all the deals that I do with, with Peter. That's awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause it's like, if you're not actually high conviction in it, then if you are that high conviction in it, you, you should be trying to get as much exposure as you possibly can. Absolutely. So. You should be taking out loans. Like Adelian has a bunch of tweets about taking out loans to invest in startups and stuff. Dude, I think his own company, maybe. But. Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I will, I'll say like within reason, this sounds sort of paradoxical. It's like being, being extreme is sort of necessary for our generation in a way that it wasn't prior. Like the Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett, intelligent investor strategy, 75% of your money in equities, 25% bonds. And then you shift it, you <laughs> yeah. know, counter cyclically. Like th that does not work anymore. It no. doesn't work. Moderation doesn't work. So I think where it gets tricky is like, are you, are you good at the venture stuff? And like, even for me now, it's like m most of my stuff's at the IRR is, is bonkers, but it's, it's, it's mostly unrealized. Yeah, and so it's easy to trick yourself, especially in this market where it's like we have $150 billion of VC locked in mm -hmm. to venture firms that like is honestly like it's getting high on its own supply. It's like funneling money towards things that it was, you know, already funding like earlier stage, marking itself up. It's it's very elusive in nature and, and it's sort of the gains I think are illusory in the case of a lot of one to $5 billion companies that are super frothy. But Having said that, if you are good and you really believe in yourself, like you, you kind of got to go for it because cost of living, if you're a young person compared to, to wages is, is not really, does not really make sense. <laughs> no, no. I mean, just touching on that, like I have no stocks. I have zero stocks. I'm out yeah. of the public market. Like I don't think about that at all. And yeah. then the last few months, like I spent time in crypto and I made more than I've ever made in my life. And it's totally. like, you yeah. have to just have conviction in that and like, my reasoning there was it was shorter term so I could like kind of crush it, make money and then, you know, venture is longer term because, you know, I'm not going to make a, a million dollars from, from just investing in a startup, you know, in a year or whatever. Cause that's oh, totally, yeah. I think, yeah. I think that's the right logic. And you were, it seemed like you were talking to all the right, every time I touched base, you were talking to all the right people and 
you had really good sort of, you had, you had a good thesis for everything you were doing. I, I didn't have the bandwidth to track any of the, the crypto stuff. It, I'm, it's not, it, it, I'm I mean, like, I mean, my content suffers and that's the hard part is like, yeah. how do you manage investing and making content? Cause making content is so much. Dude, it's a lot of not sleeping. It's, it's so hard. Yeah. And like, I also think, and, and we're both experimenting with a lot of different formats right now. I think content is harder than it was two or three years ago. I think two or three years ago, it was like, you had access to like a decent amount of people. You could just have like, and you were like a pretty good interviewer. You could just have like a long form podcast and like that would break through. And now I think you need a pretty differentiated format. You need a lot of post-production editing. Like it's, it's hard. And so yeah, it's dude, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think I'm doing it well. I think there's opportunity cost on both sides. And and my hope is it's like the, the, the effort for the show stuff starts to plateau a little bit as you, as you get into kind of safer territory in terms of a subscriber base and you kind of understand what works and what doesn't. So I'd say I'm more indexed on that now and hopefully. It so do you think out. you're working on like the biggest thing that you need to do is build a team around you to kind of start automating it or how do you yeah. think it'll, the effort will go down? Yeah, that's a great question because <laughs> I might be deceiving myself. I think it will go down as we get into a cadence and figure out which content works and, and doesn't work. I think I want to do more LA based. I've been traveling my ass off. And I, I want to do more just LA based events as, as the world opens back up uh, because, you know, we're, we're on the brink of world War three, so the pandemic doesn't exist anymore. I, I, I want to, I, I really would love to build like a kind of an intellectual epicenter in, in LA and bring a lot of people in there. And then, you know, the content's coming to you and I don't have to spend a week in God knows where, because, you know, I have to talk to some yeah. person or whatever. So yeah, that's the hardest part is like, I wanted to vlog at one point, but it's just everybody's everywhere and you can't, you can't actually like vlog because a vlog you need to, you can't be traveling all the time. It just doesn't work. Like David Dobrik, when he was vlogging, he just had all his friends in LA and he would just hang out with them. He would yeah. never really travel much. Totally. But tech has everybody in Miami, SF, LA, maybe not SF, <laughs> New York, everything like that. It's just, it's, it's, it's terrible, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Do you it, think it, LA is the, is the place to be or are you looking at moving? I wouldn't call it the place to be. I, I will say, okay, I would rank it. If I had to force rank, you know, tech investing. This is the classic centers, conversation. <laughs> it, it totally oh, is very Twitter. Yeah. yeah. I would, I would still say on an absolute basis, San Francisco is the best. Then I would say New York. Then I would say LA. And I think LA is becoming increasingly interesting for a lot of reasons. And then I would, I think Miami, I'd put Austin before Miami. I'm skeptical really? of Miami. Yeah. Why? Why are you skeptical of Miami? I just think it's a place you go to retire more than to start a company. It's like, a, it, it's, it's like a tax haven. It, you know, it's like, a, <laughs> it's a really beautiful, livable place, but yeah. I don't think you go, the, the vibe I get there is like, I made a ton of money and I want to save money on taxes. And then I want to like speculate a lot while I'm there, but I don't think an, an investor ecosystem bootstraps startup ecosystem. I think you want like weirdo STEM students and like a, you know, some, some kind of coagulation of that. You don't want, I don't think investors make, make a tech ecosystem. Yeah. So. Yeah. But everybody, but, yeah, go remote. for it. Everybody's kind of remote now. So it's like, then everybody's just on Twitter. So then the investors are hanging out there, but yeah, I don't, yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that either. Uh, I don't but I, either. But I was I was telling John Coogan earlier today, our, our other creator friend, and I was telling him like Austin seems less energetic than Miami. And so I was actually thinking about moving to Miami the last few days. Interesting. So, yeah. I, that, I mean, look, I, I don't know. That it was, what I'm saying is armchair. And I will say people like Deli and Keith and all those guys out there are doing a really good job of, you know, they have conferences and, and meetups and... I mean, they're pushing it hard, so I don't know. And then Suarez seems to be super, super friendly. He's like meets with every startup there or whatever. Yeah. yeah he's so, yeah. Yeah. So I, w I guess I would just, I think these things go through hype cycles and Austin had a hype cycle, I feel like three or four years ago. And so 
my bias would be like to fade the consensus, the Twitter consensus, and actually think like Austin might be like coming into its own now. But again, that's a very like, again, armchair mental model. But I do, I do, I'm, I'm long LA for sure. And I think like the El Segundo Hawthorne, like SpaceX, I think gets a whole slew of like graduate aerospace and mechanical engineering companies that I think are really interesting. And so I, yeah, I'm like excited to see what happens You're really interested there. in Astra, right? And they're in LA as well. Astra is, is Astra in LA? I think they're in Northern California. Okay. You might be thinking of ABL. ABL. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love ABL. Yeah. Why, why do you like ABL? I love ABL space disclaimer. I'm a, I'm a personal in, investor this is, yeah. and, and I, I love them because of a few reasons. They are incredibly operationally efficient. They've spent in their entire lifespan, what some of their competitors burn in a few months, which is pretty insane. Their unit economics are really, really solid. And those two things normally I don't like as differentiators in business, but the market for launch isn't the non SpaceX market for launch. Isn't that big. No. And so, as you know, you cover this. I, I've told you, I wouldn't, I, I I've told you before, like I wouldn't invest in, in the launch companies. Yeah. Yeah. A, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, the reason I would is because I think it's so hard to get to space a, eh? and then I look at like you, you literally like you, you look at the non SpaceX companies and it's like, can they get to space? Do they have, are they venture backed? Like, do they play in like a, a, a payload capacity that really makes them interesting kind of business wise. And, and you like, look at all these factors and like, you end up with like four or five companies mm. and then you can cut the, those, I think really like on it, my prediction would be to get specific here. It's like SpaceX, the 800 pound gorilla, they'll like on a terminal basis, be like at least half the market. And then, and then I think you'll see ABL relativity cause they're playing in the right payload capacity range. And Relativity's just done a great job fundraising, even though I'm more biased ABL. And then, and then I think you'll see obviously Rocket Lab, which is, you know, operationally stable and has, you know, been launching rockets since I think 2017 or something yeah. like that. And we will continue as well. And when you say payload range, do you, you mean like small sats compared to, so satellite, SpaceX will take the larger payloads and then you're saying they'll compete on the smaller satellites. What do you mean payload rate? Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, they'll compete on the smaller satellites. I mean, SpaceX is now in a, a Starship's 120 ton. Crazy. Yeah. It's like so unprecedented. But yeah, even even compared to like Falcon 9, you know, these guys are playing in smaller, smaller ranges. So I, the reason I, I would even differentiate between this, a lot of the small sat or what, what are called small sat launchers, like where I'd say, I, th I think Rocket Lab, and this could be wrong, but I think they're like, 250 to 300 kilograms. Like they're, they're, they're significantly smaller in payload capacity than relativity and ABL. And I think the relativity ABL payload capacity opens up more, more business. Mm -hmm. uh, but Rocket Labs, I mean, just, they've had like amazing sort of price leverage because they've been the only game in town outside of SpaceX. Yeah. And they're, they're an awesome company. I think anybody that makes it into space is so cool and yeah. deserves everybody's support. So what, but what, what do you think? Cause I know you, you look at a lot of this stuff too. I mean, the, the thing is like, I, I don't think I would be able to choose winners within such a competitive market. Cause even though it is only like six, you know, six or however many companies are trying to launch rockets and it's still such a rare thing, it's still so hard to be like, like, I would rather invest in something that has zero competition. This is, mm -hmm. this is just the classic Peter Thiel kind of thing. Like, like I think, and this isn't related to space, but just the first thing that comes to mind and what we were talking about beforehand is Michael Levin's bioelectricity. Like yeah. he's starting a startup now. Like he has, he's raising money yeah. and he, he's, for those that don't know, like he's working on regenerating limbs using bioelectricity because Amazing. he essentially thinks like we shouldn't be genetically engineering humans. Like we already have growth pathways from when we were babies to become adults. So we can just re-stimulate those with bioelectricity and like, nobody's doing that. Like so nobody crazy. else, nobody but like, else. that's what I would, if there were like five other people doing bioelectricity, then I, I think what it comes down to is, is yeah. I don't think as a, as an investor and not like as somebody who's actively researching and building in the space, 
I yeah. think I'm just actually not smart enough to be able to be like, okay, yes, this is the one. The the one thing I will say in defense of launch and is it's so, it's so hard to pull off that it then creates this like exciting right tail call option on like the, the, the space market has shifted so much, so dramatically. Like I was, I was actually like looking at talking with a friend about, you know, past valuations for SpaceX. And it was like a $350 million in like mm -hmm. 2008, which is like, it's absurd. Like how, how like l low of a valuation that is, yeah. you know, g g given that it was, again, it was like kind of the only game in town, but the market was like super speculative. And the big thing that people kind of slept on over the last, I want to say three or four years was pre Starlink announcing, you know, it's Leo constellation that wasn't really considered as a, as a use case or, or as big of a use case in space. And then you got this kind of like competitive mimetic effect where, you know, it was like Amazon Kuiper and Telesat and obviously one one, you know, I think might've even been before Starlink and, and all these, all these guys sort of popped up and that really created its own kind of really big commercial comms market on top of the, the existing one. And, and I think, I think you'll see things like that happen with space. I think it's shifting really fast. And again, that, that sounds slightly vague, but it feels like, it feels like crypto did like early on where it's just so, it's so like wild, wild west -y and things are getting figured out so quickly. Like you look, look at a company like Varda, like, you know, like I, I really like those guys. I, I don't know, you know, ex whether it'll work. Like I'm not, I'm not deep enough on, on, on the tech. But it's fucking awesome that they're like trying. I love that. Varda. Yeah. yeah, it's so cool. And I, like, yeah. I, I was going to say, I like Varda because it's something that's built on top of like what is enabled by SpaceX. And so that mm -hmm. wasn't a, wasn't able to be done like up to maybe like a, a, a year ago or something. Like mm -hmm. it's only just become possible to actually build that startup. So then you have less people trying to co compete there, I think. Um, totally. So, so like. I, I'm I'm very interested. I'm even though I, I don't like launch companies for investing personally, I'm very interested in startups that are built on top of what the launch companies enable. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah, yeah. Because like Starlink was enabled by SpaceX, and I think Starlink could be a bigger business than just their SpaceX launches. Because Elon said like totally launches are capped around eight billion or so, and then you know Starlink. I mean, providing internet around the world. I mean that's that's multiple tens of billions. So a hundred percent. And it's you, all of a sudden you're talking about software multiples and like launch is not a great, like in, in this classic sense, it's not what you look for in a business. It's like any, any single one could fail. The margins aren't like amazing. It's like super hard to like set up each launch. There's like regulatory bullshit you have to go through each time. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's not like an easy. Yeah. So I think, I think having a huge Leo constellation, just like serving a bunch of people. Yeah, that's it. That's a much better visit, which I think by the way, you know, was part of the strategy, you know, four, four or five years ago, I think that was a definitely went into, because if you really think, if you think about it, SpaceX launch alone with SpaceX, it's like, to me, it doesn't surpass like, you know, 30, 20 to $30 billion business, mm -hmm. you know, maybe yeah. you get super high multiples because it's like really unique and hard to do, but yeah. Because yeah. of all the factors we mentioned, it's like not an amazing, you know, intrinsic business. Speaking of like interesting things being built, you're invested in a startup building Acrono planes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what was the name of that startup again? They're called Regent Craft. Okay. And they're awesome. They're super cool. So yeah, I think you did a video, a really cool video on them. Mm -hmm. And they use hydrofoil. They use broken wings. They don't you don't get like this weird, like bouncy effect as you sort of land, you can land in crowded harbors and all you need is, is 40 feet of sort of lead space to, to take off. And you get 180 mile rain with, with kind of existing battery capacity. And then they go 180 miles per hour, which is six X faster than a ferry. And then you don't have to deal with like bullshit TSA wait time. So I think it's awesome and yeah. I'm so fired up about it. It's uh, definitely a hard business to pull off, but maybe the most cool and exciting thing about the whole thing is you look at all these EB EBITAL companies that have to deal with like FAA BS and these guys get around it. They're, they're considered boats, not, not planes. So they yeah. should be, 
ideally under Coast Guard jurisdiction because of ideally, <laughs> yeah, ideally is the key word there because of kind of past precedent. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm so psyched about that. And, and that's because just for people that don't know, like a chronoplanes kind of glide like a foot above the surface. So they don't actually exactly. like take flight or anything. And I think that's, that's like a fascinating example of regulatory arbitrage. Like instead of doing eVTOLs to get from Miami to Fort Lauderdale or whatever, you just take a region and then they, they don't have to deal with all that regulatory garbage. <laughs> totally. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm, I don't know which, you know, some of these Evitol companies might shake out. So, you know, <laughs> I can, I can guarantee you some will fail. I don't think that's too controversial to say, and I'm excited to see Regent take some of that talent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what else have you been like, or what were you going to say? No, go for it. We're, we're, what else have you been investing in or looking at tech wise? Man, uh, there's a Bitcoin mining company we did called us Bitcoin Corp that I'm pretty pumped about. That's doing well. They're, they're bread and butter businesses that like, I just think they're, you know, they're, they're a little less sexy, but I think they're going to just work. I just invested in actually the flip cart of Pakistan. So flip cart as opposed to Amazon, because they have a kind of a managed marketplace where they actually manage, manage the inventory. It's not a pure marketplace where anybody can be a seller, Okay, but you know, I, th I think that's a really good good business with, with strong kind of precedent and other, and other geos. And there's a company called more kind of along the lines of, of hardware and moonshots. There's a company called Nimbits, which I love, which are th these little electric vehicles that you can buy for 6,500 bucks, or you can, uh, lease for a hundred bucks a month. And it's like, I think 45 or 50% margin. So the costs are really low in terms of producing them and they sway with your body mm. and they're awesome. And you can, you can charge them with like a, you know, normal 120 kilowatt, you know, wall charger. And I think, yeah, I, I love those so guys. That's like scooters taken to the next level. Scooters <laughs> taken to the next level. Exactly. Yeah. And like, I think about that and like, again, yeah, like to your point of like, what do you want to invest in? Like, I think we're in a micro mobility bubble. So like, you know, I don't know if we need another bird or a lime or one of these like operators, all of those guys buy from the same scooter manufacturers. <laughs> and so. I think being like a differentiated form factor up upstream of that is actually interesting because I do think some of them will shake out. Like I think dense urban areas, you're going to have these cool platforms. And so that's the, that's the thesis behind Nimbus, but hardware is very, it's tough. Oh, another cool company that's very NASDAQ y is Auric, which is their, they're building a laser terminal. So, and it's super important. You're seeing it with SpaceX now where they, they have operational intersatellite laser links for these Leo constellations to, to, to work in a way that is bandwidth efficient. You need laser comms. You need really good laser comms. And so Minar to me is the most exciting kind of pub, pub they just want public actually in the UN company doing back? that. Or no, not so They were actually okay. public in, in Germany and, and, and now they're, they're offered. I'm, you know, I'm blanking on the exchange. It's either NASDAQ or New York stock exchange, but okay, okay. yeah. But they're, they're a really cool, cool company. And there are a couple of other old school companies like TSAT and SA Photonics doing, doing laser comms, but all right, the, 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 the uh, CEO kind of ran avionics at SpaceX for, I think 13 or 14 years, kind of Bulan Alton is really impressive. And yeah, I'm excited to see what they, they do. They have yet to launch lasers into space, but that's should be coming very soon. So do you, do you have any like tech that you want to see built that you want to invest in? Oh man. Yeah, but then then you're gonna get into like weird stuff. Uh, do you, I don't know if you want to get it. Yeah, I mean, dude. So I mean, this is the other thing is like yeah. your videos. You started <laughs> off interviewing what the CEO, the founder of Tinder, if I remember correctly, uh -huh, uh -huh. and then now you're like all about aliens, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, we gotta talk a little bit about aliens. We yeah. should definitely talk about it. And, and first, I, before we, yeah. I, have, I actually have my perfect the perfect answer to your last question. But what were, okay. what were you gonna? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, how did you decide to switch your content there? Like, cause that's, those are completely different topics. I, yeah, well, it, yeah. Oh, well, let me get, actually, can I get a charger real quick? This, I'm realizing this charger is not working. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great question. Yeah. I feel very bifurcated as a, as a person where it's like, I, 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 I definitely have a side of myself that just, you know, I like just like investing in stuff that's going to win mm -hmm. and. Justin Mateen, the Tinder founders taught me a ton. Like we're, we're very close and co-invest in a lot, in a lot of stuff together. And he's taught me an enormous amount. 
And that I think tra that goes into investing in weird stuff. E you know, even if you can use it towards just investing in stuff you think is, is also just going to sort of do well for, for, you know, for returns. And, and so, yeah, I don't know. I have that side of myself. And then I, I would say like maybe the more unique side of myself for the sake of content is probably like there, there is great investing content out there, but I'm also really interested in like just weird anomalous stuff and like yeah. figuring out the underlying fabric of reality. I've always sort of been obsessed with that. And so, yeah, that I've, I've, I've moved in a more sort of conspiratorial kind of crazy, wacky science direction. Yeah. And I want to, I want to ask you about like your thoughts on that kind of stuff yeah. in a second, but you know, in the beginning we were talking about how the goal with content is kind of like getting deal flow. Do you, mm -hmm. do you think that helps your deal flow? Like, have you, have you started getting deal flow from your content? Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't done any deals that I've gotten inbound from the show, but the last three deals we've done, the founders have said they love the show. And I want to say like two out of the three were like really like had watched every episode sort of thing, which was awesome. And like in certain cases, like one of them was like, a, it's like a, a trucking SaaS platform, which I'm super bullish on, but you know, I wouldn't say it's again, the most moonshotty company and even the founder who's brilliant and he, he worked at in AI at Tesla, actually, mm -hmm. like he, he would say during diligence, he'd be like, I never thought I would work on this. I just think it's such a, you know, it's, it's such an important problem and they're like growing so quickly, but like, even he is like a maybe weirder person than is represented by the, by the company. And I think there are a lot of people like that. There are a lot of great sort of right tail founders who are like into weird shit. Too. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, even if it's kind of a normal company, like a trucking company, like the person who's actually going to make an insane trucking company yeah. probably isn't going to be a normal person. <laughs> totally. So, yeah. I think there are a lot of like SaaS entrepreneurs out there who it's either like vicariously, they want to be into the weird stuff or mm -hmm. like they, they are just like not super conventional and to be an entrepreneur you have to be somewhat like you know i'm really just going to do my own thing and be kind of strong-headed and so i think i think there is some cross levering and, and correlation there but that is that is like more of an experimental thesis than like the straight up like vc content yeah um, yeah 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 like, it's a, yeah where you said no go ahead well, well i was, I was just, just gonna yeah what were you saying i was just gonna say i mean yeah my content is more straight up like tech ish. So, yeah. so yeah, well, but yours, yours is such an obvious value prop for like, if I'm like a hard tech startup, I like, I would, I would want your money over like a lot of other people's or, or like alongside a lot of other people, because it, I mean, you just have like on, on TikTok, how many followers do you have? Like a uh, I'm almost at a million. Crazy. Yeah. And like to follow you, it's, it's one of these like high signal follows, like you've got to be pretty into like hard tech. Yeah. And so you have to have so many super talented engineers following you. And if I'm like uh, Varda or Regent or ABL or any of these companies, I would be just so fired up to like have NASDAQ on my. Yeah, I, I've made some videos like, like specifically promoting hiring, like, so go work for the, or like, you know, apply. And like, people have been really happy <laughs> with how that, how that turned out. Dude, uh, I def, I def, I'm constantly surprised by like how, how technical my audience is. I, I believe it, man. That's, that's your outcome for me. I'm going to get a bunch of doctors <laughs> showing up at my house and, and telling me that, you know, the aliens uh, are coming. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's my, that's my fan base right there. Yeah. I, I think it's like geeky meaning seekers, people who like seek me. The alien thing is like a, it's like a, it's like almost like a Gnostic religious quest for a lot of people. And it is somewhat for me too. And so I think, I think that's an interesting, that's sort of like a lot, a lot of the followers of the show are like, they're looking for that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the obvious question here is like, what's your percentage of belief in aliens? Like, do you believe in aliens or? <laughs> I think like phenomenologically, and it's called the phenomena for a reason. I don't think there's an argument that like something's going on and people are seeing something. So I think I would start, I would start there. Like are people like reporting things that they think happen to them that like, at least perceptually, like in their experience happen to them. And like, I would, I would start there and not with like, are these people like full, like, is everybody fully lying? 
like that I think is like an unhealthy starting point because it just, to me, it's just wrong. Like if you spend a day looking into this stuff, there just, there are a lot of people. And then if you get past that gate, it's like, what are, what is the nature of the thing itself? And what I find so amazing about it is it's like, it's like an esoteric math problem that like no one, people have been trying to solve forever and no one can solve it. It has this like recursive unsolvability and this sort of whack-a-mole nature where nothing, no theory really seems to, to quite fit. And then all the kind of empirical observables just lie outside of, they break the theory. And so, or, or, or any sort of known physics theory that, that, that we have. And so you kind of have to like fundamentally, like open up the possibility space, like fully and, and, and really be in this like really healthy state epistemologically, I'd say, where you're not pre-crystallizing knowledge or pre, you don't have these preconceived notions about how the world works. And you're just kind of intaking information and you're letting the conclusions sort of rise, but you're, you're playing with, you're playing with falsities and you're playing with possible truths and you're, it's like this dialectic process, which I think is good. That creates good thinking. So I think it's, it's really healthy to inquire, like kind of, you know, inquire into something so unsolvable because it's, it's, you're going through all these mental gymnastics and it's so, it's so good for you. And so that, <laughs> I can't give you a concrete answer on like that's, two aliens uh, exist. That's but. such a Jesse answer, man. <laughs> 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 like I, I knew it was going to be some weird philosophical thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. I don't know, man. What do you think? Do you think aliens exist? I mean, I, I, when I answer that, I just turn my brain off and I'm like, yeah, probably like, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's how I go. I, 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 I'm on, I'm more on that side of things too. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's hard uh, to say. I, yeah. Cause then you get into like the Pentagon's releasing reports. Like why are they releasing reports and why are they establishing this stuff? Like, <laughs> are they trying to make us think that, or are they also doing it like to sigh up other nations into like, oh, we captured alien tech. Like there's so many different reasons right. that like all of this stuff could kind of be happening. There are definitely some narratives being pushed that might not, it might not, they might not, they're, they're, the push might not only be to reveal the truth. And I think it's important to be, trust your instincts and be wary of the bullshit and, and then I think there are elements of truth to all this stuff too. And so I think it's this weird, like, it's like, I also think it's a false dichotomy. It's like, is this a psyop or is it real? Which is kind of like half the episodes are on the, (laughs) it's like, is it real or is it, you know, I think it's both would be my, my sort of base case is that there's a lot, yeah, tons of misdirection, misinformation, people co-opting it for their own purposes and and, and organizations co-opting it for their own purposes. And then. I think there's an element of truth to us not being alone in the, in the universe for sure. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's definitely not something that people expect my content to talk about. (laughs) It's like, there's aliens. Um, But I think, I think it's cool that we did discuss that. Did you, you, you said though, that you also, unless there's something else you want to say on that, like you said, you also had an answer for like what kind of tech you'd want to invest in. Oh, I did. Yeah. Well, you were saying, you were asking like, like, is there a company you want to see started? I think that something around treating, treating the body using like the electromagnetic field, and maybe this actually oh, yeah. dovetails a little with the Michael, Michael Levin stuff as well, which I find fascinating, but there mid century was a guy named Royal Rife, an American scientist, and he had something called the Rife machine. And there's another guy named Wilhelm Reich, and he had something called like the, or, it was like the orgone generator or something. And Historically, there've been sort of these devices that, uh, create electromagnetic fields. They're usually like some variation of like a Tesla coil. So it's like a horseshoe, mostly made out of copper. And they seem to at least empirically have a pretty dramatic effect on people's bodies. Like they come out, especially people with autoimmune diseases, specifically Lyme disease, they come out saying they feel like way better. And then you look at something called, it's a field called cymatics, which is, it's like, you can, you can take sand and put it on a vibrational plate and you can vibrate the plate at different frequencies and you can see what 
you know, you can literally like dictate the, the, the shape that the, the sand makes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's not pseudoscience, like that's real. You can see that empirically. And so I think it's fascinating that modern medicine for the most part treats the body on a biochemical level, uh, but physics is below biochemistry. And we have no idea what sort of frequency signatures affect the body. You know, you can turn molecular mass into frequency. Cymatics is real. Sound affects the body for sure. Like you go to a sound bath, like that really affects the body. And then we are the least scientific about like, we, we should have like a sound library, yeah. you know? And I know, I know this is done somewhat through like binaural beats. And people say the Schumann resonance of the earth sort of holds the body together. And so you need to keep the Schumann resonance with you if you're an astronaut in space. Like this just needs to be studied like way more rigorously. Yeah, because yeah. the binaural beats are mostly for the brain, not for like the rest of the body. Because it's yes. like the frequency of the brain. I think that's what kind of triggers it. Yeah, exactly. And then that's that's also because that can affect binaural beats, beats can affect the body through a process called brain entrainment. And we have no idea how that works. And so it's like all, all this stuff just feels super underexplored. And the, the, my, the cynic in me says that it's underexplored because it's hard to monetize and it disrupts other things that are easy to make artificially scarce. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. I'll <laughs> leave it at that. First, do you have any, like, are there any studies of using seismatics on the body? I need to look into that. I, no, no, I don't think so. There are definitely these sort of mad scientist types who try like you know the rife machine and stuff and he claims he was marginalized by the american medical association again who i can't i don't know maybe he was just a quack who was sort of yeah. you know lying about that but no i don't think I, I don't think this has been rigorously studied at all like at the very least we should have like a library like pattern matching like this sound affects this part of the body but Dude, i think saying this kind of stuff is so important because it sounds like we're like crazy, you know, like, oh, right. like we're talking about the crazy stuff, but like, this is the stuff that's not studied is like the contrarian stuff. Like, like, I, I don't know, man, like, it just makes sense why you're at Teal Cap <laughs> um, <laughs> saying this, like, like what, if you, if you can say it, like, what, what, what did you talk about with Teal? Like the first time you met him, like philosophy man. or. We talked about the decline of San Francisco and sort of ag agreed that, you know, it wasn't headed in, in the right direction. <laughs> I think we talked about like Tyler Cowen and Jordan Peter. I think Jordan Peterson was like just on the come up at the time. You know what we talked about actually, which, which is interesting because it, it connects with all these sort of out really out there weird ideas. So we talked about a guy named Rupert Sheldrake, who was my introduction to a very fringy field of physics called parapsychology. And so I remember we, we brought up he brought up, or maybe I brought up morphic fields and, and then he had heard of this guy and the morphic fields, which is sort of like a, almost like a Lamarckian, if you remember Lamarck, like, you know, for, form matches function or whatever, like a Lamarckian hyperspace through which knowledge could be sort of inherited. And there's a lot of other sort, sort of kooky stuff around, around this guy, Rupert Sheldrake that, I, you know, I, I'd look into, we can get into parapsychology stuff if you want. And it's a whole rabbit hole. But, uh, but I remember, I remember hitting it off with him around that. And then him, like, I think looking at me and being like, like, oh, you're into that. Like you're, you're a weirdo, but like in a good way. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what he wants. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Who, if you could kind of interview anybody on your channel, who, mm -hmm. who do you want to interview? Oh man. That's such a hard question. I. I feel like I, I always have like a lame answer for that. So like, I think we should interview Michael Levin. Yeah. I, that, that would be absolutely incredible because I think that's groundbreaking. But like, I don't know, like dream, like, you know, could interview anybody. That's like Kanye or so, someone like that. I'm just such a fan. Yeah. Did, um, you, did you watch the Yeezus, the genius documentary? I did, dude. It was great. Did yeah, you watch it? It was so good. It was so great good. because it wasn't like a normal documentary that just had like people sitting down and talking about the past. Like it was just only, only like footage from the past and then a voiceover. I thought that was excellent. Totally. And the best part, and I think this is so important, is was like the come up. Like it gets dark when he like makes it. And the yeah. coolest part is the the come up, which I just found so inspiring. Like his self-belief yeah. throughout the whole thing. Yeah. And, and the way that his mom talked to him. I think that was super important. She was just like, yeah, you're great. Like, obviously, like, be great. <laughs> I know. And she would say, like, 
stuff like, you know, you, you got to keep your feet on the ground and like, you can, you can be in the air, but you also have to be on the ground. And then she had some quote, like a giant in the mirror only sees air or something like that. And it was mm. about like staying humble while, you know, being well, your remembering up. you're a giant. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you see this crazy dramatic negative effect when she dies, that, that feels like when things started to go south, like 808s and heartbreak, the crazy haircut and the Venetian glasses yeah. and that just he just felt like he was in a kind of a dark place and he was like a, he became like a celebrity at that point and yeah but yeah I it was really it was really interesting when he the narrator was like you know i grew i i came up with kanye but i haven't met yay or ye yet yeah and that was that was really interesting yeah that was interesting and it was crazy to see i think it was like 2006 and like Kanye had won all these Grammys and like, you know, he just performed touch the sky or something. And he's like backstage and what's the guy's name? Cootie, I think. Cootie. Yeah. yeah. And he's like channel zero Cootie. And then, and then Kanye mistakes his name for his friend. who's like a co-director and like yeah. wasted. And like, it, it, it was like, it was almost as if it was scripted or something like Kanye was being so like, kind of like shady and like, I'm better than you and his, and yeah. his bot. And it wasn't intent. I mean, he was just like, that was that stage of his career or whatever, but I think he forgot where he, uh, you know, his roots and, uh, and his, his, his kind of yeah, a friend. I think that's tough for a second. As you, as you become a famous influencer with all your, <laughs> you're going to have to, you're going to have to stay humble, man. <laughs> Dude. I, I, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, is the goal even fame or like, it, it, no, it, like for me personally, like it's not, it's not, I don't, I don't care about being famous at all. Yeah. It's like it's totally something else. You have to care a little bit though. Like, yeah. I think I care a little bit, but I hate that part of myself. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I care because, well, I, like I care because it enables stuff. Mm -hmm. I care because like, okay, because I'm NASDAQ, like I can talk to, you know, VCs or, or, or founders sure. or whoever I want to, like it yeah. enables that. But like, yeah, I think that's kind of what it is. And it's nice. Like when people you know, see me on the street and like, come up and say hi, like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. But to me, to me, it's more about like, oh, the impact or like, oh, I'm building something. Yeah. yeah. I think as long as you keep it, I think the other stuff will always be a little part of it, but as long as you keep that like sub 20% or something, you're, you're, you're cold. And yeah, yeah, man, I try, I, I, there's a great quote. I think it's this, the lead singer of Iron Maiden. And it's like fame is the excrement of success. Like it is, a, it's the waste, it's the exhaust. Mm -hmm. It's a byproduct and it's not, it's not an end in and of itself. And the second you get into that mode and I see this every day in LA, yeah, it gets really dark, man. So <laughs> try to, try to steer clear of that. Yeah. I mean, dude, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Yeah. I want to talk about you and what's your, how'd you get your start? How did I start on TikTok? Yeah. How'd you get your start on TikTok? Well, I mean, well, first off, I didn't even start on TikTok. I started on YouTube in like 2017. I started okay. making video 20, 2018 or so. Mm -hmm. And I, I had like just watched a ton of David Dobrik content. And I was like, oh, this, this is awesome. Like he went to LA, he started a vlog squad. Like he just made friends. And then he's like, he has Kendall Jenner in his vlogs. Justin Bieber, like he did a great job. And I was like, maybe I can kind of do that with startups. Yeah. Um, and so I started like making vlogs on YouTube, but like, I mean, it was impossible to grow. I mean, you know, I could have stuck with it, but then TikTok kind of came around and end of 2019, when Elon presented the Starship infrastructure for the first time, like I just made a video recapping that and it's a terrible video. It's, <laughs> so, it's so funny to go look back <laughs> on it, but like it got like 300,000 views and I was like, oh my God, this is insane. Like, this is super cool. So then I like doubled down on like SpaceX Starship kind of stuff. And then I expanded into space and then startups in general. And like, I always had the idea of like NASDAQ as a content creator, like making money from content, meeting people, mm -hmm. and then investing all of that back into startups. And so Hell like, yeah. then it, TikTok kind of just like enabled that. Yeah. When it like 20 years from now, where do you want, what's your ideal, you know, like for, for NASDAQ? How are you spending your time? What are you involved with? What are you doing? describe that dude i ask myself that every day i don't know i don't i don't know if i have the answer i i think like you know maybe in five years uh, if the podcast goes well like i just want to be kind of like joe rogan like just at my place like having people over talking Tell to you. them 
And then like, I'm working out in the mornings or in the evenings, like, I just want to be healthy. I just want to be happy. And then yeah. like, you know, take that money and invest it in startups. I don't know. At one point, like I was like, oh, I make like a massive VC fund. I could make, I, I could do a lot of things. I, I just don't know, you know, what I want to make, I think. So I think yeah. I, right now I want to talk to people and be happy. <laughs> I, I think love that's that, like, man. that's kind of where I, where my that, head's at right now. That's beautiful. Joe Rogan really is a great role model because I, like you think of like influencers versus like he has a family he loves. He talks to like amazing people and it, yep. but it's like once a day and it's for a few hours every, every day. And then he has like his craft in the form of comedy and he works out and he, you yep. know, d does martial arts and, but he's not like on his phone being like, Hey guys, it's Joe here. Like he's not an influencer. And I don't, you get the sense he doesn't even like really manage his own social media. He like pops in, posts something, doesn't look at any of the comments. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is an amazing place to be. Although, yeah. you know, right now, maybe he's not in a, such an amazing place, but like very sort of locally yeah. speaking. But uh, I mean, I think he is. I think I think he's kind of got it down. I mean, he has he has kids. He doesn't really like they aren't famous or anything like he just has a family and he just kind of loves that life. I think that's I think that's goals, honestly. I yeah. agree. I'm just talking about people trying to attack him right now. About, yeah. Like, you know, that Neil Young trying to pull his music. <laughs> Off Spotify. But Neil Young went back on Spotify. I know it's hilarious. Quietly, <laughs> quietly. Yeah. Tail, he tail he immediately him. went back on Spotify. I'm trying to think. What do you think in terms of cities? What do you think is, is the most interesting thing? Well, out there? I, I think I kind of want to go to Miami. I think at least for a little bit to experience it. And I've been really obsessed with like golden era bodybuilders lately. And, yeah. I kind of, I, and honestly, I just want somewhere where I can go outside and work out all the time and be in the sun and just get really jacked and tan. And I think I that actually, and then there's also a great like tech scene, like Delian's out there. I was talking with like Mike Solana the other day, he's yep. out there. So like, if I was out there, I oh, think it was Solana's have, out like, there. I didn't know that. He, he's been there in SF. Okay. So I think like if I was out there, like, or that's what he was saying. And then, yeah, I think if I was out there, I'd have a bunch of people that I could just hang around and like in the tech scene. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, my, my Amy's cool. I, I, I don't, don't listen to my skepticism around it and i do think over a long time horizon it's probably probably a great place to be it's definitely a great place to to live that's the thing is like weather so i mean i think i have like i get seasonal depression <laughs> whenever it's like really cold and not sunny outside and like whenever the sun comes out like i just feel a million times better so i just need to be somewhere south i think and like i've done texas i've lived in texas for a long long time so like going to florida something new what's the craziest idea you've heard recently that you got excited about what's the craziest idea that i got excited about lately mm -hmm. mm, i mean i i was interested in living carbon i mean they're genetically engineering trees that's not super crazy that's um, pretty cool yeah it's, it's just really cool so i made some content about that and then i've been interested in like colossal creating the woolly mammoths or colossus or colossal i always mix it ben, up. ben lamb's company yeah yeah, yeah. colossal i think yeah yeah I don't know. I don't, I don't have a great answer to that. I've been, I've been too into crypto and <laughs> I, I, uh, what do you think is going to shake out? What do you, what do you think is going to happen with, with crypto? Do you have a prediction there? Cause I, I, I go back and forth on the, the whole space. I think the one thing we can definitively say is like 95% of it in each cycle will like go, go away, away. Yeah, on a terminal sure. basis. And For then sure. it's like, what more concrete things can you say? I don't, I don't know. What... <laughs> yeah, no, I have, I have nothing, I have nothing to say about like anything. Like I, I, I don't have much to say about like the, the meta future of crypto other yeah. than like, I think like it might say around it, like opens access for people who don't have access to traditional finance and stuff. Uh -huh. But it, it, most of my crypto has just been like very like in the weeds on the ground, like <laughs> aping shit, finding like good plays, trying to make returns like that. Yeah. That's more what I've been thinking about. Yeah, you, um, you gotta hook me up, Nash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I'm done with that. I'm done with that, man. I, I, I'm tired of crypto. I want to come back to hard tech because, you know, I, I made my money and now it's time to like focus on the the longer term things instead. You of can just, like, you can offload all your tact, all your trading tech. <laughs> and then no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I mean, I think I yeah, I think I, it's it's especially hard. At, you know, you're you're so young, but I, you know, and so I think I think doing it in the 
especially in the bull cycle and if you can make a lot of money like it's it's almost stupid I mean, not to so, it's so, like, so yeah i was just gonna say like the people that i've been uh, that i was working with in crypto like like we you know group chats are the best place to be like that's how you that's how you do it and the group chats that i'm in i mean they're founders of hard tech startups like of, co of companies and like they are not crypto people but they're doing it because the timeline of hard tech is like 10 years out man yeah and so you and you you're paying yourself like nothing you have yeah. equity but it's 10 years out but or you could make money short term and it's a really hard thing and i think a lot of people that could build really interesting hard I tech know. are going into crypto that, and that sucks that sucks that that worries me a lot and doesn't seem healthy or good uh, that along with like it feels so like tech feels so self-referential and and kind of indulgent decadent right now it's like you raise you know you have some crazy blown out c round and then you raise a series a and then you like sell a bunch of shares and you have like a fund while you have your company yeah and like it's like this stuff doesn't really work and then the company obviously sputters out yeah and then like you stop doing the fund because the management fees are so good and like it's just weird man and there's yep. a lot of it going on. And and if you're like good enough of a bullshitter, you can like do all of that in no short order. And People aren't just raising money and then selling secondaries and then I, cashing I out and then I starting know. a new one. Yeah, it's fucked. It, That's, it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy. It is crazy. It feels really unhealthy. And so that's why it's got to burst. And that's why I think focusing on angel investing in people who are just obsessed with their idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where it comes in. It, and, and another way I'd put it and you're positioned really well in this paradigm is in investing, you have different functions. You have a, an attractor function, you know, your initial top of the funnel deal flow, you have a decision function, you know, like, did I make the, the right sort of, sort of decision here? I think the decision function matters not at all anymore or Matt, it matters like sort of it's, it's, it's important. Like you obviously have to make the right decision, but just making the right decision as, as long as like a critical amount of other capital knows about the deal that you're going to make the right decision on, you're still going to get, it's going to get priced out and, and the IRR is like not going to be great. So like all of a sudden, like your right, your correct decision of being directionally long stripe starts to get really shitty at like 175 billion market yeah. cap or whatever, where it's like, dude, you're, you're paying up too much. And so really the attractor function is where I think you, you differentiate like your top of the funnel deal flow. And so I always think like the, the most underrated investors generate serendipity really well. And that's why it's this like really hard to replicate sort of ephemeral thing. And we actually had this author named Sebastian Malaby who wrote a book called the power law in our office. And he was sort of like, he was kind of making fun of that implicitly. He was like, I was asking all these great VCs, like Mike Moritz, all these great, those amazing people. Like, how do you do what you do? And you would get these like hokey anecdotal answers of like, you know, like I'd meet people at coffee shops or like, you know, I like whatever, but it kind of is that it's like, it's this weird thing where I think the, like the best investors just generate like these, like almost magical, like run-ins with like the right people and they yeah. seem to do it over and over again and they like bond with them and and it's, it's like amazing friendship forms and then they invest yeah and uh, and i think that's gonna work really well on a go forward basis and then the like the decision function thing like i just got this decision right matters less and less because capital is just getting super commoditized that's is, see the hard thing about that is that you have to choose a city then you have to go to Miami and be like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to bump into people or right. then the, the more, I guess, modern answer is like, okay, I'm going to shit post on Twitter. And so this is why all <laughs> the VCs are just, this is why Mark Andreessen is now shit posting on Twitter. I, saw, uh, I, I remember like his first shit post and it was like, oh, you've made the like Elon decision. Like you, 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 you somewhere, like you, you came to the conclusion that this stuff works better yeah. and earnestness doesn't. And you like, you're leaning into that. But yeah. I, I, man, I fucking hate Twitter. I just, I, I just like, like, it is a, it's just like this, like narcissism of small differences, like toxic war zone between people who like, they're so similar ultimately, like, you know, and it's, and then 
they and they just hate each other and it's just snarky and it's like all these cheap shots across the bow that like i don't know it just feels negative and 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 bad and then and then i I, ironically also it feels like counterproductive as a country because like i remember being on clubhouse and like you have like this api that clubhouse uses called agora which is like a chinese api and like you know all, all this stuff that like us thought leaders are thinking you're just ending up on like ccp servers and like twitter's kind of like that where literally you're putting your ego ahead of like what the right like actual strategy to employ is and like i I don't know i see a lot with the russia ukraine stuff i see a lot of people like mouthing off like being super anti-ukraine because they're just like anti anything that the u.s federal government does and it feels really scary and unhealthy compared to like the Chinese who can literally like, like they can say like, like the CCP can like lie in terms of what they say to the outside world. They can lie at the Munich security conference and say they care about Ukrainian sovereignty. And then they can say that, you know, it's, it's all, you know, us bio warfare in Ukraine. That's sort of like causing, causing the initial, you know, invasion or whatever internally. And I, I see that dynamic and then I see the U.S. and this like Gerardian, like, like cesspool, like, like every, all our elites are just like uh, killing each other. And it's scary, man. It's really, <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it doesn't feel healthy. Yeah. So you're kind of saying like the Chinese leaders are focused on actually doing stuff. <laughs> They're focused on actually doing stuff and the, the calm strat. There's an amazing freedom and freedom of speech are amazing thing. And I would never give them up. And I feel like they're being encroached upon by big tech and by kind of mob cancel culture. But there's a way in which kind of the elites in the U S are engaging in like stupid egotistical signaling and infighting because of forums like Twitter that you don't really see going on in places like China because of a lack of freedom of speech that ironically ends up, I think, geopolitically and strategically adaptive for those countries. Yeah. Because they just hold the line on whatever they're supposed to say. Whereas here, I agree. I think discourse is really important, but whatever's going on on Twitter doesn't feel like healthy discourse. It's not like a good vibe. It's not like when you're in a, a room with somebody and it's this healthy Socratic symposium sort of peripatetic like you know what's going on here i don't know you tell me and you're sort of like you know figuring it out together it's like you're just hurling shit at each other and it's fucked up and weird dude i think that might be your most contrarian opinion that the chinese (laughs) lack of free speech (laughs) bad in most ways bad in most ways and i would never i would never trade our our system for theirs but uh, but it See, but, and and also at the same time, like if you tweeted that opinion, it would be totally taken out of context, like completely taken out of context. Like you could never put that on Twitter and and never have a rational conversation about that. No, that's right. A hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. People don't understand. There's no nuance anymore and everything gets clipped and, and it doesn't, the context doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make a YouTube clip of this conversation and make, make you look really bad. (laughs) (laughs) You could do that. You could do that. (laughs) No, it's, it's, it, I know, man, it's, uh, I mean, do you think about that? Like, I I think about that a lot, especially because I, I cover kind of edgier, weirder stuff. I think you have to think about it more than I do. That's probably right. Yeah. Yeah, Your your stuff is generally just positive, aspirational, like. Well, but my stuff is tough in a certain sense, because I'm talking about really weird tech. And so like. Some people just might not understand the tech, but also at the same time, like, you know, I'm, this is why I think I want to do the podcast versus like making shorter videos about certain companies, because that information that they put out online, like, is it actually like, like they could put something out online, but it could be a complete trash fire on the back end. And like, unless I kind of talk to the founder, or a researcher or whatever, like to give me context hopefully you know assuming they're uh, being truthful about that like like uh, i'm just kind of you know putting out their propaganda a little bit so i do think yeah i do think there is like a worry with like me yeah talking about that stuff and then being like is it actually true is it actually happening like i don't i i I feel like that as well (laughs) and every startup ceo and founder has to be a propaganda artist at some level for sure literally the fit facts But I think, I think it's interesting to like, even if the startup fails and the thesis is wrong, 
if it's really generative and like, maybe it's like a 1.0 idea that needs like a 2.0 iteration that the person watching the thing is going to be like, this is awesome. It's just, it's missing X, Y, Z thing. And I'm good at that thing. And I'm going to like, I'm going to do a different version of it. And so I think putting startups on the, on display that are like generative, as long as they're not like Theranos style frauds, I think is, is still pretty positive. But did you know that Theranos was a fraud before it came out? Like from just the media from it? <laughs> That's a good, yeah, totally. No, I think, I think hindsight is twenty twenty. I think, I think companies like Theranos, it's more of a gradient and a continuum between Theranos and SpaceX than people like to admit. Yeah. But, a and it's a bootstrapping yeah. thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, what were you going to say? I was going to say, it's also a bootstrapping thing. Because it's like, if Elon had failed, I guess, like, then they would have said, yeah, it was impossible or it was fake or there wasn't totally. whatever, like, but because he succeeded now it's like real. And it's like, maybe if, I don't know, I don't know if it's like physically impossible to do what Theranos was trying to do, but she just didn't, she, you know, I, I, also, yeah. I don't think she was the right person or like, she that's, wasn't the scientist. Like, that's where I'd make the distinction is like, she would like, you know systematically lot like for sure you no know, she had she had she had these like it was like her board was full of like you know these like generals that were super high they up. weren't actually like Henry Silicon Kissinger Valley. and Schultz yeah. and yeah and they yeah exactly they weren't BC nobody actually knew anything about biotech was involved with the company yep. and so I think if you like I do think if you or I were to look at a company like that today we'd be like there's something off here mm -hmm. and I hope so yeah I hope so too exactly <laughs> But, and then, and then there's the idea where it's like, okay, if the thing is off, does it hurt people? And if the thing, if, 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 if it doesn't, then I don't think the stakes are quite as high. It's like a person trying something that's like generative and it's a hypothesis that they're trying to like sort of flesh out. And if it hurts people, then I think you have to be super strict with your diligence and you've had, your filter has to be really tight. Otherwise I, you end up peddling bullshit. Actually. So speaking of crypto, I think. Now, though, most grifter personalities might actually gravitate towards crypto and like NFTs or, you know, any Definitely. of these scams because Definitely. it's so much easier to do that than like pretend to have a hard tech company. So maybe it's like, sure. it's actually, that's a great, that just helps increase the quality of the hard tech companies. <laughs> yeah. Like it, like it siphons off the like, yeah, the bad grifters. people. Yeah. Yeah. The grifter. That's, that's an interesting take. Yeah. I don't know. I'm more, I, maybe I'm always too pessimistic on this stuff, but I'm more on your first analysis, which is like, it's just misallocation. I think actually Delian has a great tweet that I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm like, that's actually a tweet from Delian. It's like, it's like a, it's a tragic misallocation of talent. Our, our, young, our generations, younger generations are spending their time on digital Ponzi schemes, Yeah, which is, it's just, it's pretty absurd. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. It really does. But you're right. You see it, you see it short time horizon, positive feedback. And you're like, all right, I'll, you know, why don't I try that for a little bit? But mm -hmm. that's not good. Yeah. And so, and so whenever I think I have people on my podcast, I think there's going to be like a caveat that like, I'm asking questions. I think that's what Joe Rogan does. It, it, you know, like Joe Rogan doesn't say I fully 100% support this. Like, he's just like, dude, I'm just talking to them. I'm just I having know. a conversation. It's like, I'm not promoting this. It's like, he's just like, dude, I'm just talking. Well, the most interesting truths that are worth talking about aren't no, like we don't know what's true. So you have to, this is my problem with this whole, like it's misinformation. Like you have to play with misinformation to get to ground truth on anything. Like you, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of like a good example. It's like, I, I, I my mind is, sorry, go ahead. No, where, yeah. Where were you? My thinking? mind went to like COVID lab leak. Like if you couldn't talk about that, then. That's you know, a perfect, but example. I don't even know if it's, uh, I mean, I don't know if they confirmed it or whatever, but like, it's now the you, consensus. Yeah. They're it's now the consensus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so like, people, yeah, it, yeah it, but you couldn't even talk about it in the beginning. You couldn't you had even to. talk about it. Yeah. You had to, and you have to, you have to like, you have to in your mind be like, could this be true? And like, and like talk it out. And then, you know what? There's something off about it. I don't think this is true. And like, and it's cool to display that in the form of media and entertainment. And you're not necessarily, as you say, like you're exploring truth and you're playing with misinformation in the service of truth. If you a priori hermetically seal yourself from something you think is misinformation without engaging with it and, yeah. and actually understanding like it deeply enough to know that it's misinformation, 
then you have a horrible thought process. And so I think that's the big problem with this whole day is you have this like smug credentialed class that like th these like bureaucrats who are, aren't even necessarily like practicing in, in a lot of these fields. And it's just like, it, no, it's been, the science has been decided, or this is, this is, this is the truth. This is it. And like, I won't even get into the specifics because this is where we get into sort of dangerous territory. I'm going to keep this vague intentionally, Yeah. but, but it's just such a, it's a citadel. It's a far cry from what the university system is supposed to be and what like, you know, a, a healthy Socratic debate is supposed to be where you, you figure out truth to, together. It's this like weird dogmatic thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I wish I had something to follow up on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. <laughs> but yeah, but to, and then to your point, then it's like, you should be putting, like you should be, I almost, I think we're over indexed on the people who are like, they think they know exactly what's right. And like, what I love about your content and, and my content is it's, it's like, it's stuff you think is really interesting and generative and it starts a conversation that's really important. And that alone, I think makes it again, if the thing isn't going to hurt anybody, it's, I yeah. think it's, it's totally worthwhile to, to cover. And then, and then you just have to cover it honestly and be like, I don't know if this is going to work, but it's interesting. And then you're, you've done your job. Yeah. And the podcast is perfect for that versus like editing and for, for me personally, like editing and being like this, then this, then this, then this, like podcasts, yeah. like what, what's happening here? Yeah. Totally. So that's just candid. Yeah. What, yeah. this is like a complete different topic but what yeah. what's kind of the just the way that you speak i mean like did you learn a lot from working with teal or what did, what, what have you learned from him i've learned a lot from him like an absurd amount i think he i mean he has a million superpowers i'd say like maybe the two best superpowers are like attracting incredible people that would maybe be number one number two is, and he's called it a look ahead function, which is a, a, a funny way of putting it, but his ability to like evaluate a project and be into the future of like, is this going to work or is it not going to work based on like its current elements it is, is Nostradamus-esque. <laughs> it's, it's freaky. And I am not, I'm, re, I'm good at the first thing. I track great people. I really am not amazing at the, like the look ahead function thing. It, and he's made me much, much better at it. And I, I've gotten, I think now I'm very good at the, the look ahead function when it comes to other startups, cause that's, that's the job of venture capital, but increasingly I'm becoming better about it with my own life, which I feel like I, I, in many ways, like the amount of like URLs I have like lying out there, like in my name, because I like tried to start some, you know, stupid company, like selling like like single bladed razors or whatever like yeah, i have hundreds like, of urls yeah right right yeah. and and like i needed to some extent i think guardrails which which peter i think was helpful in sort of the self-assessment stuff and and you know telling me no i think you should spend your time here and and, and not here and then yeah i mean just through osmosis too he gave me a, a also a model i you know i came up in silicon valley because i'm an old geezer i'm like you yeah. And it came up like, you know, it, it, it was like 2014. So I'm not that old was when I moved there. And, and, you know, and, and it had a long history before that. Maybe that was even the beginning of the end. But the ethos in Silicon Valley was at the time very like Tim Ferriss, like it was like optimize your life. And like, and like, I, I didn't really, I thought like into intellectual life was like a waste of time and like, even in college, like, you know, I went to Columbia and there was like core curriculum and like I, I spark notes a lot of it. And I thought a lot of it was sort of a waste of time. And while I was at Google, I just, I just felt like I had to optimize my life and like make money and like look good and be healthy or whatever. And like, and then you're in and, and have the right people around and then you're good. And I've totally forgot about reading and engaging in ideas. And, and Peter gave me the, the mimetic model of like, you can be super ambitious, like, and try to make money and have influence. And you can be this like philosopher person who's just like thinking about like how the world works mm -hmm. and that those two things can actually cross lever in like really unique, interesting ways. And I just had never, I had never met anybody, I, you know, it was always like these super ambitious kind of optimizey types who were really conventional, or it was like, you're this erudite philosopher stuck in an ivory tower 
who like has no impact on anything. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that marriage of, of kind of archetypes in one person was like mind blowing to me. That's so funny. Cause I, I never would have, I mean, the way that you present yourself now is you totally come off as like, you read the philosophy, like you care about that stuff. It's interesting to hear you say that you used to just not care about it. And then oh, you like yeah. reinstilled. Do you think Peter's like care of philosophy, like how much he cares about philosophy? Do you think that helps him with the look ahead function or what do you think kind of helps him there? Or like, how did he help you with that? Oh man. I think a lot of it was through osmosis. It was like seeing him, he would look at a project and it was like, okay, like, you know, too, too many co-founders and like the, the roles are overlapping too much. Or like it was, you know, the, there, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to botch these examples, but it was like, you just see you pat your pattern matching. It's like, gar it's like machine learning garbage in garbage yeah. out. And your pattern matching just gets way better. Like the, the more like better decisions you see made and you see him like looking at stuff and he's like, okay, here's a good one. He's like pay payments. He always heuristic is like payments always work. And it was <laughs> like, it, and it's like, you know, Stripe is an amazing stock before that. You know, PayPal was an amazing stock, keeps going up. Before that, Western Western Union, you know, was, was an amazing, or no, it was like Visa and Master, MasterCard. I skipped over that. Great stocks, keep going up. And then Western Union, like maybe still a good stock to this day. <laughs> or like, finally, maybe that's plateauing or something. Yeah. And and so like, that's just like one fun example. But you, you just, I, I really like, I like hitchhiked my way into level of pattern matching that was like way beyond me. And like, I'm still learning every day. Like he, you know, he's just like, wait, 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 light years ahead of me. Yeah. And, but seeing him make the decisions in real time just is, 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 is priceless. Yeah. That's fascinating. And just, I wish, yeah, I wish you could make content like watching him do that. I think that would be just, yeah. because it's super hard for you to describe it. Right. But, I know. Like, but obviously. And that's something that really frustrates me is like a lot of the best content I think can't be shown because like, so like that content, if yeah. you were talking about Teal, talking about something, I mean, like it's a private company, like they're building something, can't yeah. really talk about it publicly. Like, and that really bums me out about a lot of things because like they, they just won't tell you their secret, you know, uh, or whatever. And, and that's the interesting part. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I know. I, I think. I think about that too. Like, could you, could you film like, well, here's an interesting idea. You invest in a company, then you have a strategy session with the company and it's a super prescient thing where you come up with all these great tactics for like building, you know, building it up mm -hmm. in the future. And then it's like a, it's like a, a time stamped time capsule or something. And in two years you come back to that video and you look at this like really cool strategic conversation. Maybe you film all your strategic conversations and then you you have this cool time capsule. And I think that that would be an interesting experiment for like a, a VC if they're super high trust with their founders and like actually the, sort of the, the yeah. trust. So Dude, to speak with at them. one point, at one point I was thinking that I, sh I should record my pitches and then, you know, in like five years or something like release those. Like that'd be awesome. I, I was thinking that'd be really good content. It'd be great <laughs> content. It's like real life yeah. Shark Tank for yeah. adventure. Yeah. But duper cool. That's why Shark Tank has terrible or like, you know, whatever companies, not terrible, but just like consumer product companies. Cause like they have a patent on it or whatever. Right. Because they're not revealing secrets. They're just, they're getting promotion for their company, but like, okay. there's no way that a, a region would go on shark tank, you know, it's, it, I don't know. They're giving away too much. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I totally. Agree. And that's I something we're both trying to solve. I, think. I know total, totally. And I think if I have a one criticism of startups today. It's, it's that they go public too, too quickly, not public IPO, but like they go, they, you know, hit tech crunch a little too fast. Mm -hmm. And like, if, if that's not like adaptive from like a recruiting or, or fundraising standpoint, like don't do it. You should, mm -hmm. you know, you should, you should only do it when you, you hit a state velocity. Cause you think it brings in competition. A few things. I think it, I think it create it, it creates a catharsis. There's actually, there are like studies that show that like it creates a catharsis that tricks your brain into thinking that it's done something. And so I think there's this like false sense of confidence and success that comes from press that like, it becomes a big distraction. You get addicted to it. And then you also like think you've done something and you end up on these like Forbes lists or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you really, you're just, and then you start, you're just on start a Forbes speaking list. on a tour. Yeah. 
and yeah. and you haven't done the thing. The thing never got built. So I think it's that. And then and then I totally think you're signaling, you're sending flare signals left and right to competition that you know are not. They're not signaling focus. They're just they just want to build. Mm-hmm. So the 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 counter is that like okay, if you have something actually really great that nobody can replicate, then it doesn't matter if you go public, like, because nobody will copy it. <laughs> like Elon yeah. was just being like, look, I'm going to build rockets and I'm going to build electric cars. And everybody was like, you're crazy. And, and he just did it. And anybody could have built Tesla. Like, I mean, you know, not anybody, but like seeing it in 2008, like his, yeah. he wrote his master plan. He was like, look guys, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. But nobody else, no, <laughs> nobody did it. I think just, I guess the unique thing there is that it didn't create catharsis because like even yeah. today like a few weeks ago or maybe a few months ago he I, it was during thanksgiving when people wanted to take times off t- time off for thanksgiving and he wrote an email telling the employees he was like look raptor production for the starship like is just not up to par like we can't take a day off like if we don't figure this out the company dies and it's like yeah aren't yeah are, are they gonna die maybe yeah. but like yeah. like probably not yeah. But like, he was also like, guys, we won't be able to get funding or whatever it was like, like he, he just will not rest on his heels. And, and that's, that's just he's super amazing. rare. He's yeah. amazing. And he's, he's, he's a case where it is super adaptive also because the liquidity that like his super fans have bought him in the public markets and private markets is just uh, immeasurable. I mean, clearly like the, the multiples being slapped on everything that he's doing are so absurd but they're not absurd because it's because it's him and he he told that story just so so well that you know it's it's given him all sorts of dry powder to to actually execute on the things that he wants to do so i think yeah i mean he's i i can't say he's a he's a freak he's i'm grateful he exists and he's the best entrepreneur maybe (laughs) ever and then the best marketer ever too. He's just like the best in all so many categories. Well, it, it's it's insane because like how many other people could you talk about and make like a career out of it? But like there's so many people on Twitter, YouTube, like just following his every move and making a career out of it and like making money from talking about the things that he does. And like that in itself is like a fascinating ecosystem. Like people are literally like, I mean, even me, like I told you that my first video as on TikTok was recapping Elon's Starship thing. And like, it's just insane how many careers, how much money he's made people that aren't even like working for Tesla or SpaceX or even invested in the stock. It's a, like that's it's the amazing. interesting part to me. I, f- I fully agree. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah. yeah and, he's and, and, and related to that, when I, th- my like theory of when you've made it as a creator is yeah. when people can make videos about you and make money from them without like you, like, you know, coming on their podcast or whatever, like they just yeah. make a video, like talking about you and then, and then, you know, they want to do that. I think yeah. that's when you've actually made it. Totally. <laughs> I love that. That's a really cool, I like that. I'm going to follow that away. Would you <laughs> say for, for you, would Elon be your number one guest? I would imagine, right? For, I mean, it, it, yeah, it would just have to gotta be, be for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, that would, that would, that would do numbers. So that'd be great. Be uh, epic, man. I think you can do it. I mean, you got, you have everyday astronaut hanging out at the launch pad yeah i mean i'm i'm friends with everyday astronaut like i was Mm -hmm. down with him at spacex boca chica like we were hanging out so but the the thing is like there's you know i have to i have to work really hard to to actually make that kind of stuff happen i i I would be surprised if you don't get get the elon interview at some point i mean i think it's in his best interest so Mm -hmm. that's the thing it's like it's a i i think and this is this has kind of been my mentality lately or like my thought is that Every problem that I have is mental or internal. It's like, like if it if it's a problem that I never get an Elon interview, it's because of it's purely because of me. It's nothing external because everything that I've done externally points towards that Elon thing. And so that's actually, I don't know. It's it's like comforting, but it's also like a lot to be like, fuck. It's all it's all in my mental <laughs> like, yeah 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 it's all internal i think it'll happen man yeah yeah I'm not i just working. gotta i gotta push and i i what i really need is i need to build a team to like yeah. help me make this better and like get a studio and fly people out and stuff like that but you know it. once i make some money and stuff then i then i will <laughs>
Dope. And, I can't and, wait to yeah. be out there in the in the studio. Where are you now? You're in Dude, I'm in Utah. T- you're in Utah. Yeah, I'm in I'm at the edge of Salt Lake City just because I was like, I want to be near the mountain. But I just came out here for a little bit and then okay. I'm, I'm gonna leave soon. I'm going to Austin next week and then I might like I was saying, I might move to Miami. Like I'm not I I, I need to figure that out. It's just really hard to to figure out where I want to go. Yep. But yeah, all yeah. In Utah right now, randomly. And so I need to find somewhere new. Come to LA, man. <laughs> yes. We I, have content and startups, the entertainment mecca. I know. Startups. I know. I know. See, that's the thing is like, there's me and John are here too. There's good reasons for, you know, everywhere, I think. That's uh, true. Which sucks. <laughs> Cause then it's, yeah. you just have to, I mean, it's good, but that's a good to problem to have. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I'm a big, whatever I can do to pick <laughs> LA, let me know. Yeah. Well, you'll, you'll come visit I'll, me in Miami. Wait, let me, I, I will definitely. I'll come visit yeah. you in Miami, but wh- let's go through this for a second. You cover hard tech. Yeah. LA is great for hard tech. All the livability stuff that you talk about in Miami, you can basically apply to LA. John Coogan and I are here. <laughs> you have, you have TC, you know, and all the interesting stuff we do, all the talks and, and stuff. Real estate isn't quite as crazy because you have this vast expanse, you know, it's, it's city built outwards, not built upwards. I really think the only thing you could point to as a, as a negative is taxes, which sucks yeah. and definitely compounds when you're young, but are you optimizing for taxes or are you optimizing for like hundred to thousand X returns? Like you're optimizing for serendipity. You're optimizing for like network and people and, and opportunities. And then you have the entertainment stuff going on here. I think you should move to LA. I'll, I'll give it some thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was a good pitch. <laughs> yeah. No, that was a great pitch. Okay. That was a great pitch. No, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got to figure it out though. Anyways, man, I think, I think uh, we're coming up right on the, on the end here. I'm looking forward to seeing more of your content. Uh, like where can people find your stuff? Just where should they, they go follow you? Go go to Jesse Michaels. Michaels is spelled with no A. I know it's annoying. It's abated by existence. Is it is it Michaels? It's Michaels, but okay, it's, so you know, you they fucked it. up on Ellis Island. Damn. <laughs> so go to go to Jesse Michaels, like and subscribe. The the name of the show is called American Alchemy, but the YouTube channel is Jesse Michaels. Two S's. Two S's. Thank you. No I in Jesse. Yeah. And yeah, you'll be prepared to have your mind blown with free <laughs> content and mushrooms and aliens and mushrooms aliens ufos and some cool startup stuff too and yeah yeah awesome well thanks for coming on i appreciate it man thank you for having me leave a leave a comment if you want nasdaq to move to la (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 that'll and that'll also show that you watched the the whole video so you know extra appreciation for those who (laughs) (laughs) hell yeah yeah i uh one last thing i think this was a good uh podcast just because like most of my, I was telling you before this, most of my other podcasts were like grilling people with questions, but this was more conversational. So I love it, man. Yeah. It's just like we're all practice. Out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just practicing that kind of stuff. Amazing, awesome. man. Cool, man. Appreciate cool. it. Talk all to you. All right. Yeah. yeah. Later. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Like, comment, and subscribe. Definitely comment where you guys think I should move just to prove that you listened to the end. And then, um, I'll see you guys in the next one. I have a satellite founder who's trying to replace GPS coming up next. So I'll see you guys there. And also, maybe I should have put this in the beginning, but give me some feedback. Like, let me know if you guys like the podcast. Let me know if you want me to pursue this path. I'm trying to figure out like what NASJAQ is outside of being a TikToker um, because I just, I got to evolve in my content. And I think it's either podcasts or short videos or maybe like a podcast where I have a co-host and we just talk about, you know, what happened this week. I don't know. Like, so give me some feedback guys. And yeah, definitely let me know if you're enjoying this. So, cause it's all for you. Like that's, I'm doing this for you guys to hopefully like make you inspired about the future or think about the future or, you know, hopefully provide some entertainment, something fun for you guys to just listen to other than, I don't know. I, I mean, I feel like a lot of content is kind of, I'm trying to create something different. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, just give me some feedback and I, I'll see you guys in the next one.